This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, Galaxy Finance. Sponsors and personal friends that I trust, that I trust enough to go to with questions about my own finances. That's not a sales pitch, that's fact. Any questions, any queries, they have the solutions from home loan lending to complete financial planning. With official interest rates at an all-time low, the lenders want your business. With Galaxy Finance, they'll do all the work for you and find the best possible deal. They'll do it all. Get in contact, ask for Leanne, and mention Unfiltered for a free chat. A free chat. No obligations. A free chat just by mentioning Unfiltered. Galaxyfinance.com.au is where you can find them. The great ones, they're different. They really are. Not better, just different. Sure, there's a physical power, a mental strength, a complex but resolute constitution too. There's a whole lot more than just the measurables. That's something else, that intangible. It separates us from them. Welcome to the Legends series on Andy Raymond Unfiltered. This bloke, he probably took care of your favourite player and you may not have liked him for that, but you would have loved to play next to him. For all the intimidation, for all the physicality, the real guy, he's very different to what you'd probably imagine. But who is Jeremy Smith? Now you've got me with a cracker right there, mate. (laughs) Um, Yeah, who is Jeremy Smith? I suppose just a happy, easy, go, lucky sort of type of guy yeah. um doesn't mind a beer or two or 10 or th- plenty yes but uh yeah no just i'm I, I feel i'm pretty easy going a lot different to what you've seen me on the field that's for sure melbourne st george illawarra cronulla and newcastle as we sit here in 2021 who's your team oh i love them all i, I love the knights because i finished at the knights yeah but definitely have a soft spot for the other three teams Cronulla, you know, after that, they're doing so well, or yeah. after they won their premiership, um, I always say to a lot of people that uh, that was on the back of my performance there in 2011. Run with it. <laughs> and, Run. and running with it, yes. Yeah. We had some dark times there, but uh, pulled them out of the slump. But no, uh, and, and definitely the Dragons, you know, they were, yeah. they were a great club. And Melbourne, obviously, the first team to, um, you know, give me my NRL start. So Where'd you play your best footy? With who? What year? If you had to narrow it down, um, oh, probably two thousand and I'd say two thousand and eight in okay. in, Mel- in Melbourne. I'd I'd say like we had a fantastic team and we went on a great run and yeah and obviously we got beat by Manly that year but we went on to win the World Cup as Kiwis and um, yeah I had a pretty fair fair year that year. The forgotten fact: your first club was actually the merged. Northern Eagles yeah. in 2002, right? Yeah, something like that. It was a while ago. It was 2001 or 2002, I think. What uh, happened? Um, oh, I don't know. I got the sack from there. Peter Sharp sacked me from there. And he ended up in Melbourne in 2004. And he said, that's the best thing I've ever done. I pretty much made your career by sacking you from there. And <laughs> <laughs> obviously, if anyone that knows Sharp, he's a, he's a lovable type of yeah. character. And yeah, no, he's a good man. But yeah, I suppose it was just... Um, I don't know, just not the right time, still a little bit immature and yep. uh, went down there thinking I was a first grader and I wasn't even, I was a nothing, you know, and nobody and mm. carried on like a pork chop and they just didn't like it one bit. So It happens a lot. Young men are thrust into an old guy's position and physically you might be ready. Mentally, completely different story. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think like the back when I first started, like obviously went down to Manly, mm. I thought it was all about getting on the piss and, you know, having a good time after the game and, you know, footy mm. was just a part of, I suppose, what was going to be. Yep. And, um, yeah, I, obviously I did like a drink then and, mm. you know, still like a drink now. Still but, like a drink, yeah. And um, it's it's just – I just had the wrong mindset going down there. I just mm. thought, you know, I've, I've got all the, the gear, you know, I'm hanging around first graders, mm. but yet to play first grade and I think I just got a bit too far ahead of myself and then – Obviously, I got picked up to to go to Melbourne, mm. and I really had to knuckle down there. And 
It's part of learning curve as a bloke, not not just as a footballer. I think on and off the field, all of us, bar none, go through maturity issues and and climb the the learning ladder. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's the game's a lot harder nowadays, being the way it is. Um, sometimes you you might get a couple of strikes, but most of the time you one strike, you're out. Yep. Um, clubs just don't want to deal with that sort of behaviour mm. anymore, and um, that's. Yeah, and that, that's where it's at, and I suppose that's what it's led to, um, to the young blokes nowadays coming in, it being such hype around them and not mm. performing and, and obviously falling out the back door pretty quickly. You'd return back to Q Cup. Did you think, okay, that's it, that was my chance of blowing it, or Sharpie's blowing it, <laughs> and I'm not a first grader? Yeah. Or, or did you think you would still work? No, definitely. I thought my chance is, is done. Yep. Um, I'd really sort of... I'd just come back. I was in between playing for Tweed or playing for Burley. And yep. um, Tweed were just coming into the Queensland Cup. And then, yeah, and I sort of took Tweed and, and chose there. And, and I had a couple of good games at the right time of year. Mm. And obviously went and played residents and whatnot. And, um, yeah, got picked up. Peter O'Sullivan picked us up to take us to Melbourne. Sunday, August 15, 2004, you'd make your debut. It was round 23 playing against Canberra for Melbourne. This was the Storm lineup: Bill Slater, Matt Geyer, Steve Bell, Ben McDougall, Matt King. The halves, Scott Hill and Matt Orford. Forward pack, Robbie Kearns, Cameron Smith, Steve Kearney, Dave Kidwell, Dallas Johnson and Glenn Turner. The bench. Now, the bench was the home to four future internationals. Rodney Howe, Ryan Hoffman, Cooper Cronk and yourself, Craig Bellamy was obviously the coach. An amazing lineup of superstars <laughs> oh, to debut with, mate. When you read it out like that, <laughs> it certainly is. You look back now, and I, I just sort of look back at that game and see the boys, but then didn't realise the, I suppose the the, the magnitude, the of magnitude it, yeah. of the player, the calibre player yeah. that we did have, and obviously how we come Rodney Hare coming off the bench, yep. Hoffman, like yeah, it was a pretty good team. What do you remember of your debut game? Oh, it's pretty funny. I was. Uh, I remember it pretty fondly, actually. I come on, my first touch, I scored a try. Yep. Smithy, Cam Smithy, sort of... Robbie Kearns, I was come on the field, supported Robbie Kearns. Mm. He offloaded it back to Cam Smith. I've done, like, a big loop around where Kearns had just been tackled. Smithy, obviously, he was pretty much over the line and just put it on the platter for me. And I just pretty... I fell over the line pretty much and it was a try. But uh, it was um, a real good game and I... I just remember copping, like, I suppose the first time I went to Canberra, copping stick from all the Canberra fans. And, yeah. you know, they are, like, second to none. They love the Raiders. And yeah, yep. especially as a kid growing up, I was a Raiders fan too. And then Were you I, really? Yeah, I was. And then obviously got to play against yeah. Ruben Wickie, you know, who I looked at growing up as well. And But, yeah, definitely it was, um, it was definitely one to remember. So much has been said about Cameron Smith over the last 12 months, the, you know, the 400 games and his retirement. Uh, his status in the game. What a lot of people have forgotten because he's been so good in these last 10 years. He was dominant from the start, really. Maybe not as dominant, but he was always something special, even those early years back to 04. Yes, definitely. You know, I suppose with Cam, he was just always cool, calm, collective. Yep. Um, he took everything in his stride. He was... What you see is what you got. You know, mm. he never looked frazzled. He was always composed, and you know that's he went on to to lead Melbourne to a number of premierships. Yep. Um, obviously, Australia so many times, but yeah, and he's just I don't know. He's, it's hard to explain. There's a lot of people that don't like him for what they see, but if you ever got to sit down and have I a agree. drink, drink with him, and or ha- have a talk to him, he's he you know he'd give you the time of day if you want to have a good chat to him. Okay, setback number two. Two games in 04, none in 05, why not? Um, oh, I got sent back up to the Queensland Cup and I just couldn't... Oh, I, I, I thought the QRL didn't like me as a player. Yep. You know, they always tried to keep me on the suspended side of things. and I spent a fair bit of time on the sidelines in yep. 2005 and I just couldn't put them together. I couldn't play one game half decent for um, Norths. Yep. Suspended for three. You know, that year I was sat. Probably, I played probably about eight or nine games and spent the rest on the sideline. Mm. I just couldn't 
you know, I just couldn't get things flowing and um, I went back and Bellyache pulled me aside and just said, you know, it's, what do you want to do? You want to concentrate on playing footy because I was still there or thereabouts or do you want to, you know, come along and, and give first crack a real good, good crack mm. at it? This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, Galaxy Finance. Sponsors and personal friends that I trust, that I trust enough to go to with questions about my own finances. That's not a sales pitch, that's fact. Any questions, any queries, they have the solutions from home loan lending to complete financial planning. With official interest rates at an all-time low, the lenders want your business. With Galaxy Finance, they'll do all the work for you and find the best possible deal. They'll do it all. Get in contact, ask for Leanne and mention Unfiltered for a free chat. A free chat. No obligations. A free chat just by mentioning Unfiltered. Galaxyfinance.com.au is where you can find them. That was the chat. That, that was the chat, yeah, I got, yeah. And I got that from him. And um, end of 2005, I trained, like we finished our our season and I trained from the end of the season mm. right to the pre-season. So I come back and I was fit. Yeah. And I, you know, I reached all the goals. I, that was probably the fittest I've ever been. And I, I just needed that to be able to get me mindset straight. And then obviously having having my oldest daughter, she was, she was 15 or 16 now. Mm. So having that as well at home and training and I'd already done the hard work before mm. the pre-season started so I knew I was in, in pretty good stead. Roughly the same age as where you start maturing off the field. It's, it's amazing how <laughs> things link up yes. throughout our lives, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. 26, you know, I was still, like, I, like you said, I was still maturing and yep. as, a, as a player and, and like as a young man too. Mm. It was, um, took me a little bit to, to work out but I got there in the end, I think. How much did you have to change as a player? How much did you have to change as a bloke? Um, as a player, I think I just needed to be fitter, mm. um, work harder on the little things that I did do right. It helped having Cam there as well, yep. you know, um, and Croc. And obviously, 2006, we had a pretty fair lineup as well. Mm. Um, and as a bloke, I, I think it was just having 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 a baby is sort of yeah. reeled me back in and um, sort of going out till stupid hours in the morning and waking up hungover with a mm. baby is uh, it's not the best feeling. No. But Mick Crocker, as batshit crazy as he is, and we've done a Legend Series interview with him, um, a wonderful mentor, one of the most professional guys the game has seen in a long time. As I said, crazy, as a, as a, a mad as a cut snake, but in terms of his rugby league, he is an absolute professional or he developed into a professional yeah definitely he was my training partner when he first come down to melbourne and um after every session or weight session we'd take he'd take me upstairs to the rowers and you know we'd just yep. go nut it out on the rowers we'd have three minutes for a thousand meters and you know you'd get on off their wobbly legs about to spew and wow. you know, i suppose that helped contribute yep. or reform me into the player that i become obviously off the back of him and yep and yeah, he doing everything that he he's done in his career, and then me sort of just pretty much starting out where I was. Um, he was called. He didn't like to be called Mick. He was Michael or, or yes. Croc. Um, Mick was his alter ego, and <laughs> seen that a few times. His, his oh <laughs> yes, that's a beauty too. <laughs> it is a beauty. Oh uh, six, oh seven, oh eight with Melbourne three grand finals, one win, two losses. The 06 grand final, you went down to Brisbane 15-8. What's your standout memory of, of that day? Oh, I just remember running out there, like, overawed. My first grand final. Yeah. Thought, you know, getting to the grand final seems pretty easy. Yeah. You know, obviously went out there, the bright lights, stunned mullet, just sort of, I just couldn't really put it together. I was yeah. run off my feet. I got, I got on the field. I come, come on and it was about... Oh, it must have been about twenty to go, or twenty, yeah, fifteen to go. Mm. 
had one hit up, made three tackles. I was gone. I was fatigued. Like I was just knocked up real quick. Because you started from the interchange your first two GFs. I would imagine yeah. the energy and the adrenaline sitting on the sideline oh, did yeah. it just tear you apart. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I just got on the field and I just, I, I'm normally pretty composed and I just lost it. I couldn't, couldn't put it together and give away a penalty. And then obviously it just snowballed from there. And yeah, it wasn't the fondest memory. 07 grand final was the chance to erase that memory. You played Manly. You won 34-8, your first premiership. What do you recall about that day? Oh, I just, I knew what to expect when I got out there. Yep. Um, the crowd, the the way everything was going, you know, I'd, I'd been there and done it before, so I knew what to expect, when to pump myself up, when to get going. And, um, yeah, like, like I said, it was, it was, it was good. We... Made a little half break. I remember putting Clint Newton to the backfield and mm. told him he bombed the try, but he reckons he passed to Bill and Bill's like could have passed back to him. But I said, mate, I'll put you away and you just couldn't seal the deal. Do you still remember the first one uh, fondly, 07? Uh, win? The first win? Yeah, do you still remember it fondly? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah we, we played pretty well that day. and Very much. You know, um, the little things that we did practice for at training did yep. come off. Um, it was yeah, it was just a well-oiled machine that day. You know, we everything we did turned to gold. Um, yeah, it was one of the fondest memories. Oh eight, you started in the second row with Mick Crocker. A day that wouldn't end well. Imagine the Beaver putting one over here now. The boy from Narrabeen, he debuted in 93. Now, it's come from Offord to Beaver. He got it away for Robertson, he got it back for the Beaver. Oh! Steve Menzies has scored. And oh! Oh! Menzies is over yes. the line. <laughs> Stephen Menzies has scored in the grand final. His departing grand final. A 40 point loss, 40 nil to Manly. What went wrong? Oh, Manly were just on fire. They, I oh, credit to Manly. Look, nothing that we could do mm. would. I don't think they. No, no team in the NRL would have beaten them that day. Yep. They were, they were just on. And when you come up a red hot team like that, that are on the, every little mistake you make, they make you pay for, and they, you know, they made us pay dearly. It cost us forty that day. I interviewed the legend Bob McCarthy recently. He still to this day has regrets and pain from the nineteen sixty nine grand final. 52 years ago, and yeah. it hurts that much. I just saw the look in your eye and your demeanour change when I mentioned that grand final. Does it still hurt today? Yeah, definitely. You know, I suppose like you're in the record books for a reason now. Mm. You know, 40 zip. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's just nothing that we could have done or or did try to do mm. that would have paid off. Or you know, like I said, Manly were on, and you know, it happened to us in 2006 where we got beat. Obviously, we beat them in 2007 mm. and they come back and out knowing what to expect. And, you know, timing is everything, in, in, yep. especially in the final series. You know, you either, you've either you got to run into the final series with, you know, good weight behind you or you've just limped in there. And I yeah. think you know, after Broncos, we sort of, Cam was gone and we I think we played Cronulla the following week. Mm. Cam and I missed that, that week. And then, so we, so we sort of, we weren't, an oiled machine. We, we yep. were sort of we were, we were limping in. You there. limped in. Yeah, that'd be your last game for Melbourne. You're off to the Dragons. Um, business decision? Is that what it was? No, Belly Ake just said to me, yeah, pretty much was. He he just pulled me aside and just said, you know, like we can't sort of keep you around too much longer. Mm. Um, I think I still had another year on my contract there, yep. but he just said like it. You know, that's, that's football. You know, I'm letting you go now. I'm not let. I want to let you go. Um, which, you know, the type of man he is and, you know, the type of relationship that we striked up was, you know, I was happy for him to come and tell me that during mm. the year. Um, I met with the Dragons in 2007 to go there for 2008. Okay. And um, that just didn't eventuate. I was pretty happy where I was. And, yep. And I was sort of hoping a few things went my way so I could stay at the Storm a little bit longer, but... Um, wasn't to be so it's um <clears throat> yeah I suppose moving to the Dragons wasn't a bad thing either absolutely it wasn't a bad thing two years with the Dragons nine and ten 
Uh, two minor premierships and that grand final win over the Roosters in the second year. Bombie knows there's a chance. Soward puts a little kick in. There's a try for Gaznia. Gaznia, I think, has got the first try. And Mark Gaznia with speed, momentum, catches the ball, gets it down just inside the dead ball line for opening points. B behind Scott and here's Boyd into the back. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Nineteen goal and scored for the Dragons. Did winning a premiership for the second time, did it feel any different from the first time or didn't it quite live up to the first one? Um, it didn't quite live up to the first one. Yeah. Not hype-wise, but just... I was happy to see the people around me celebrate like I celebrated in 2007, you know, like, and I just remember sitting back after the the whistle had gone and just watching everyone just, you know, explode and, you know, we just achieved something that a lot of people don't get to achieve in rugby league and here I am, I've got to do it twice. Yeah. So I suppose... You know, just watching everyone's emotions was, you know, that, that's where I took it all in. Whereas yep. the first one, I, I was, I was doing what they were doing. You yeah, know that's I mean? right. so I, I Well, was... your role had changed as well. You'd gone from the young kid to uh, the guy the leader. that the, the mm. Dragons had bought as a leader. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose um, I knew what to expect, and I said mm. to him before the game, I just said, like, this is it. You know, you've got to make whatever you do. You make your first effort, your best effort, yep. and that will set you up for the game and we went out there and you know credit to the Roosters you know they were they put up a good fight in yep. the first half it was a tough game it wasn't until you know we started sort of put, well I think half time we were down to uh, eight six or eight eight four I think maybe half time I think you guys got three tries in the last 14 15 yeah. minutes we hope you're enjoying the Jeremy Smith story Before you go, make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening so the next episode drops immediately. And we'd love a five-star rating and review to help us spread the word as we look to expand the unfiltered brand and bring you more. Make sure you come back soon, legends. This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors at Griffin Air Conditioning. You can find them at griffinair.com.au and tell them Unfiltered sent you for a cool deal. Welcome back to Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Jeremy Smith story. Previously, we spoke about the mischance he thought would cost him an NRL career. His story is unique, successful and intriguing. It continues. You mentioned uh, your role there at the Dragons was one of a leader. What's what's a leader to you? Um, well, a leader to me, well, for, for me, like I, when I had leaders at Melbourne, I had Robbie Kearns, Steve Kearney, Dave Kidwell, that... Um, when the shit was about to hit the fan, yep. it was going to get them first. And to me, that's what I used to take out of it. Um, mm. you jump on my back and we're going this way. I'll pave the way for you. It's yep. fine. And so for me, a leader was showing them the way and never looking under pressure or always being mm. cool, calm, even when the shit was going down. Yeah. He was still there to keep fighting to the end. Happy to wear the bruises yeah. almost. Yeah, definitely. Hell of a footy side that Dragons won in 2010. Yeah, wow. It was like, we, yeah, that 2010 side was, it was a good, real good team. I, I suppose, but in yeah. saying that, you know, always, I hate to say it, but if Melbourne were there that year, or, or, I don't know, it could have been a different story. Yep. It's just, well, I just, I just, I feel like that we, we beat, every team but we didn't beat Melbourne mm. because Melbourne 
that obviously of what happened in 2010 to Melbourne. The salary cap scandal broke <clears throat> around this time, uh, stripped the storm of, of their points, also mm. stripped the storm of the 2007 Premiership. What was your immediate reaction when, when you found out that news? Because that impacted you yeah definitely um well it didn't really bother me because i still had the ring to show it you know yeah. i still had the the ring i've got the tattoo mm. you know i've still got the memories to see that game to visualize that game and say well you know they haven't taken anything from us because we've still we've got proof yep. the only thing that we haven't got proof on is they've taken the um, <laughs> the little medallion bit off the <laughs> off the trophy because <laughs> when i was in 2010 i, yeah. I oh there's one missing here <laughs> Even um, with the, the minor premierships, um, mm. when we won them with the Dragons, I still look for because we won them in 2006, six, seven, and 8. Yep. And I look back there and then I've gone 9, uh, yeah, 10. Yeah, 9, nine and 10. 10 Dragons, yeah. Yeah, so I pretty much won five premierships in a row. Yeah. Um, minor premierships. As we sit here today, do you consider yourself a 2007 premiership winner? Most of your teammates from that day do. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course I do. I, you know, we lived and breathed, and you know, we, we, um, we done the hard yards that mm. year, and you know, we paid the ultimate price by getting to the grand final, and then we got to the grand final, and we, we won the grand final. It wasn't easy for anyone, but at least in Melbourne, the Melbourne guys were grouped together. They had a support mechanism around them. Yeah, you didn't. Yeah. How tough was it? Yeah, no, definitely, especially when. Yeah, you, know, you got the media coming up and trying to talk to you about what's yeah. happening, and I'm I'm just like, well, you can see what's happened. Like I've got no say in what's going on. Yeah, you know, it is what it is. It's used there to try to make something out of nothing, and obviously the NRL put their foot down, so there's nothing I can do about mm. it. Um, but no, definitely, I still I still think that we won it that year. You know, we were the best team all yep. year, and you know we proved it Grand Final day. Time for a change to Cronulla for two years. You didn't experience the same success in terms of results. Did you enjoy your time at the Sharks? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, you know, the first game we went down there and we had a we had a good off season. I think it was 2011. We went down to Canberra and got touched by 50. I remember getting on the bus back, my head in my <laughs> hands, going, "What have I done?" I can never have made the wrong decision here. <laughs> but then obviously, you know, it was a learning curve and they yeah. we had a few first graders. We we had a few players that were fringe first graders, but we didn't have a first grade team as such. It wasn't until two thousand and twelve that we bought and we had more first graders yeah. that we were you know, we made the semi finals that year. So it was um it was a lot different and but yeah, you know, you, you live and learn and um you you make friends along the way that mm. are in the same boat as you. Like obviously Bomber, he's gone through the same. Yep. Now, um, if I wasn't at Cronulla, I would probably wouldn't know him as well as I do. Yeah. They were building a roster, but building a culture and building a club, much like the Rabbitohs had done uh, six or seven years earlier. Again, you were brought in as the leader to try and set the standards on the training paddock and in the change room to allow the next generation to see what you did mm. and mimic your actions it's a uh, it's a significant role and responsibility isn't it trying to mold these young men who are wonderful athletes into just good blokes yeah definitely and i suppose that's that's the hardest thing nowadays is like you can get the best young kid but yet if he's no good in the change room or yep. he can't hang around and have, a, and have a chat, well, yep. then what good is he? Because yep. the culture is built around the the team dynamics mm. of everyone getting along. And if you can't get along mm. with one person, well, then obviously he must be, you know, the sour grape that needs to be moved on. Yep. I suppose that's that's the one thing that Flano had me there for to try and build that culture. And people always ask you, what how, do, how does Melbourne get such a good culture? It's because... They have a no dickhead policy. Yep. There's if someone doesn't fit into the group, they are sold out. Which is I can see that happening at other clubs now. <clears throat> and if you are that dickhead, your options in twenty twenty one are fast running out yes. because most coaches and, and boards realise that you know 
the one bad apple in the group can can spoil a whole lot. Yeah, definitely, and it, it just runs through the club like a cancer. And yep. once you once you know your club is going well, it's like when we went to the Dragons. Once the club was going well, yep, there was nothing going to stop it. Mm. You know, it's like Penrith at the moment. Penrith are on fire, yeah. and they, you know, they are. Uh, They've got a good group of players that yep. obviously love hanging around one another, mm. and you can see it on the field. At this time or around this time, the Sharks were also in their headlines. It, all, it seemed like every day the joint was struggling under the weight of the drug investigation on a personal level. How did you cope with that? Because immense pressure on the club and on the individuals involved in the club. Yeah, definitely. That was hard. That was mm. yeah, It got touted as the darkest day in rugby league. Yeah. You know, and to be a part of was never, you know, it was never going to be nice. You know, it was never a nice outcome. Whether we we did or we didn't, we did know, we didn't know, like, we didn't know. Yeah. Like, and that's just the way it was. Like, you have a supplement, you take it, yep. and it's on the club to, you know, duty of care. <laughs> Everyone's going, but did you know? I'm like, well, no, we didn't know. Like, yeah. We were told. We were told, and that was what we did. Do you find it easy to deal with issues like that? Because it's it's not a football related issue. It's a life issue that has personal implications. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, is it easy to deal with? Can you block that out, or, or does it have an effect? Oh, it, it did. It did have an effect. Like because at one stage there, every time you'd type in my name into Google, like oh. the first thing that would come up would the Asada drug allegations, sure. which is, you know, yep. for myself, my family, the kids growing up, you know, they want to, oh, let's Google Dad and, and yep. that's what comes up, you know, like, which was, you know, it was tough at the time, but yeah. um, it's not so much now, I'm just like, yeah, well, it is what it is, you know, yeah. there's, that's footy, you know, we we admitted guilt to something we weren't guilty of just to get everyone off our back, pretty and to, much. And to keep playing. And to keep playing. Yeah. And again, you were brought in to create the culture within the dressing room and a couple of years later those young men that you had a hand in pointing in the right direction would win the premiership yeah. was that rewarding for you i mean you're at the knights at this stage but did you watch that grand final and oh, think, i was this is cool yeah i was down at the grand like because i retired that year i think was that what was year is that 2016 16 yeah, yeah so i retired that year and they played melbourne and i remember being with all the boys that had retired and they had to do a Q and A at half time. Oh, yep. who, you, who you got? I'm like, you know what? I hope Cronulla go well. Mm. I hope Melbourne do well. So, so you're sitting on the fence. Of course, I'm sitting on the fence. Like I'm not going to pick one club over another. Yeah. I love both the clubs that I played for. The lure to link with Wayne Bennett while you're still at the Sharks. How strong was that? <laughs> it's funny because I had a good relationship with Wayne. Obviously, we had him in from the 2008 the Anzac Test that he he helped out with. Yep. And you know we just struck a, struck off on a good note, and yeah. I'd always talk to him and keep him, you know, keep in touch with him. And then obviously when I was at, because he let me go, because he did the same thing as Belliac did to me at the um, Storm. He yes. pulled me aside and said, you know, we've got Matt Cooper coming back. There's, I mean, not Coops, Gaz coming back. Yep. So we've got, you know, got to free up some space here. Um, I'm getting on now because I was what 30, turning mm. 31. So a bit long in the tooth there. He goes, just go off and. You know, obviously make as much money as you can yep. while you can still play half decent footy and you know get your money's worth there. Mm. So obviously I went to Cronulla and then played there and then I'd always talk to him. Said mate, you need someone like me up there to. You sold yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then obviously, obviously made him pay for it. Yeah, <laughs> pay pay right. for it too as well. So getting up there and and reuniting with Wayne was 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 yeah it was pretty handy. It was good. Griffin Air Conditioning offers the highest quality of air conditioning sales and service across the Sydney metropolitan area, providing installation and maintenance to commercial, domestic and industrial customers. Working with this team, you'll be guaranteed the latest services, technology and developments in the industry. Visit griffinair.com.au and tell them we sent you for a cool deal. He's different, isn't he? He is a different creature. He's, he's a, um, well, different creature, but also very different from the Wayne he wants us to believe that he is. Because that's just not him. No, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And 
Yeah, you know, the, the Wayne, the, that's what people say. Is he really like that? He's, no, he's not like that. Nah. He sits down the back of the bus. He loves hearing all the stories that the boys are tossing yep. up and he's got he tries to chime in there with his dry sense humour. But that's, I suppose that's Wayne and that's the way he wants, wants to be perceived by, by the public. The Newcastle dream looks so positive. Let's get Wayne Bennett in. Let's get a group of hard-nosed seasoned veterans in. We've got Nathan Tinkler and we've got the money. It looked great. The dream was alive. Didn't end as well as, I guess, what everyone would have hoped, did it? No, definitely not. I think um, 2013, we had, a, we had a pretty good year. We got to the prelim yeah. final that year. Um, I, I remember leaving Newcastle. Well, and this is, like, this is why I hold up Newcastle in a real soft spot from mm. you know, playing there, obviously. We, le- we left... We left Mayfield, and we're on our way out, and the streets were just lined with like flags all, wow. all the way to the freeway. And then going along the freeway, there's like the odd flag waving. Yeah. Like, and it still gives me like goosebumps now thinking about. That's very cool. Yeah, and they always said like when the town when Newcastle are doing well, the town mm. is doing well, and you notice the difference. Like especially in 2013 when we had that good run to the to the semis, and yeah, you, know, you certainly notice the difference. Retirement at the end of 2016. Why? Some say, okay, my body's had enough. Some say their mind has moved on. Was it either of those or both of those for you? Um, mentally, for me, I, I, the kids were getting bigger and yep. faster and stronger. The body was still hanging in there. I, I could have played one more year, but I just mentally thinking of another preseason trying to get that out of the way and limping into round one. And mm. you know, towards the back end of my career, I'd, I'd barely train just purely because I'd put my body through yep. absolute torture yeah. just to you know, try and keep the respect of the change room and you know, make sure the boys are – I'm leading by example mm. and I didn't want to let anyone down. So, <clears throat> um, But just mentally thinking about, I suppose, the pre-season because they yep. do get pretty, pretty gruelling and – I just, I just didn't have it in me to go again. We can sit here with the benefit of hindsight, but as we look back over the last 20 years, the way the game has changed and the way the players that play the game have changed, your style and the style of Michael Crocker and guys of the like, the game almost outgrew you as you got into your latter years. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think the old hustle and bustle and, you know, that's it. try and flex your muscle when yeah. you run at me and I'll run at you yeah. all day, that's, that's gone, you know. I'd, be have to, I'd have to chase someone to try and get hold of you to square up now. Yeah. But uh, I suppose watching the game, it's, it's fast and exciting, but, yeah, definitely. I suppose it's a bit like Trent Merrin at the moment. He knows that he can't yeah. keep up with the pace of the game and... Which is credit to him because I I would never let the game like you wouldn't let it beat you yeah I wouldn't let it beat yeah. me and I suppose when I obviously retired I retired at the right time and the game was only getting quicker the kids were getting younger faster bigger stronger and I just stayed the same <laughs> 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 which was never never nice <laughs> the game has tidied up so much for the mums that want the six year olds to play the world has politically correct to a point of craziness the game has changed on the field do you, do you like the game you see now where there can be so much niggle and so much niggle from a halfback because the halfback knows he's not going to cop a punch in the face mm. no i don't like it no. i i just think it's a, an easy out for the little blokes that get lippy that yeah you know Obviously, can't hold your hands up, mm. but um, no, I'd, I'd prefer, like, if you're going to get cheeky, well, then you're going to get yeah. one around the ears. Because generally, the big blokes <clears throat> don't get lippy. They just start throwing hands, yeah. but yeah. the little blokes get lippy and then hide behind <laughs> the big blokes. Yeah. Yes, no, definitely. It's, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm all for it. It's like some of the penalties they give away now. I'm just like, oh, yeah, was that really a penalty or yeah. were you just trying to, Please the crowd, or trying to—I don't know—trying to keep your job for the next week, I suppose. But it's—that's it, yeah. It's—it's um, it's definitely not what the game used to be, and and I suppose the game was different before I played as well. So yeah. it was rough, tough, rough and tougher again, which is—I you know, like that sort of style of game, and I dare say Croc would have 
been right next to me too. <laughs> exactly right. Forgotten fact number two, you're a goal kicker. Two from three with a <laughs> career success rate of 66%. You'd probably be able to remember both your successful kicks. Well, oh, yeah, I remember I kicked one in my second last game, I think. But I, always, I, I kicked for New Zealand too. We went on tour one year. I think it was a 2007 tour over to England. We played Great Britain. Christian Inu, me and Christian Inu had a kick off after our last training run and I got him I got the job and I couldn't miss over there either. Wow. <laughs> might find that. David Middleton might find that in the yeah, archives. We'll have to have we'll have to have a look. You were born in New Zealand, Samoan heritage. Um, you represented the Kiwis twenty three times, not Samoa ever. Would have you liked to have repped them? It's now easier to represent, you know, uh, the emerging nations, the Samoas, the Tongas. Would have you liked to have represented them once? Yeah, definitely. It's funny you say that because in 2005, I was moving house from Melbourne to the outer parts of Melbourne. Yep. And um, I was meant to go up and play for Samoa. They were playing Tonga at uh, Campbelltown okay. in 2005. And I, I'd said, yeah, I'd agreed to play, but didn't realise my house settled on that day to go and move wow. here so yeah I, I was I because I, I never ever thought in my wildest dreams that I would have played for New Zealand so yep. Samoa was always going to be my country of choice yep what do you recall of the first time you represented New Zealand how special how emotional oh yes yeah, yeah it was pretty emotional yeah. played I think was it 2007 where you played oh yes oh yeah I remember it <laughs> fondly <laughs> we played bloody Australia in Wellington and we got touched by fifty. Oh. <laughs> they, they kicked. We kicked off, and um, I think Big Pet dropped the ball. Petro dropped the ball, or the ball bounced back towards me, and I just run straight onto it. Yeah. And I picked the ball up, and I just seen the line right there, and I was just like, oh. And I think uh, Campbell, Gary Campbell, was our coach at the time. Yeah. Come off at half time, he goes, mate, why didn't you pass the ball? Like there was open spaces outside here. I said, mate, this is my first test, my first touch of the ball. I'm not passing the ball. No. I could have scored a try. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, that was that was that was it. We went over we ended up going over to Great Britain that year and we got we got beat three nil um by the by the Brits, but they had a good team that year. It was about this time that the culture in international rugby league started to change in the fact that you wouldn't just go and play for your nation. You'd learn about your nation's history. It was a period where, for New Zealand Rugby League, they moved into a really professional and successful state. Things like learning about the culture, learning about the haka and the meaning of it, it, it wasn't just something you did. You learned about the history of it. Yeah, definitely. I think for me... Because that was the year, 2008, when Steve Kearney and Mooks come on board. He was yep. coaching the Kiwis. I remember playing Great Britain over there and Big Mozza come up to me, Adrian Morley, mm. after the game. And we he just beat us 3-0. He just said, mate, don't worry, like your country's in good hands. And I, yeah. I, I took that a little bit personal. Like I'm like, well, no, it's not in good hands yeah. at the moment. You know, We're over here busting our ass and we can't even be competitive against you, yep. you know what I mean? So I, I, when I went back and Mooks got the job, you know, I sat down with Mooks and I just said, like, listen, this is where we're at. And I took it real personal about him saying that to me mm. um, after that game, you know, you'll be all right, you know, your country's this. I was like, well, I'm not copping that on the chin. Yeah. So I went back and <clears throat> obviously had a little fair bit to do with Mooks and obviously it being him in Melbourne, so we'd always talking and yep. chatting and then um, we played – the Anzac, the centenary test, yeah. put up not the best fight, but it was half decent. Yeah, and I agree. <clears throat> obviously, the World Cup that year, we went on and um, we just hit our straps that year. I think everyone knew their role. Yeah. Um, we had a good culture. We had the boys that liked hanging around each other. Yeah. We'd sit in the team room for hours on end, playing cards, singing music, you yeah. know, doing what Kiwis do and, you know, just chatting. Good blokes. <laughs> Good blokes. Great footballers. And, and yeah. what a wonderful result against the odds. Uh, that final mm. at Suncorp, just amazing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It was, um, you know, the Aussies, they sort of come out. They sort of had a they sort of had a tough preparation too. They, they played, I think they played PNG and then Fiji in the semi and then mm. played us in the final. And we had England 
and then played England again. So we were battled hard. We, were, we had hardness on our yep. side. And I just think that sort of, you know, our mindset leading into that game, we were physically ready, mentally ready, and, and we were ready. What was your strength as a player and as a teammate, if you look back now? What, what would you like other blokes to say about you? Um, oh, other pl- blokes on my team or playing against? Playing against? Pl- playing against, they still say <laughs> lots of things about you. You've scarred them for life. Oh, no. <laughs> now, the guys you played with, what would you like to be remembered as? Oh, playing with, definitely. Um, playing with, I suppose. You know, someone that you could definitely count on mm. would, wouldn't let you down um, I didn't really say too much but when I did talk it you know I must have been had either had the shits or I'm trying to get my point across yep um, but yeah I suppose good bloke in the change room and just a good knock around 215 games 23 tests a reputation as a bloke who's decent honest and loyal on and off the field Jeremy Smith you sir are a legend thank you We hope you've enjoyed the Jeremy Smith story. Before you go, make sure you've subscribed to the podcast wherever you're listening so the next episode drops immediately. And we'd love a five-star rating and review if you could. It really helps spread the word about the unfiltered brand and allows us to bring you more. Make sure you come back soon, legends.